Today marks the seventh day of grieving and sitting Shiva. As Judaism teaches us, after seven days of Shiva, we stand up, we emerge from the dark, we do not have to accept, we do not have to move on, but we stand up. So today we emerge from the darkness. We are taught that the righteous do not complain of the darkness, but rather create light. Today we begin to create light, and we do so as the resistance, and we fight and fight and fight for good, for love, and for justice. Rabbi Joel Simmons. Um, it's definitely felt like that. <laughs> it's felt like the past week has been um, such a strange one. So um, so I'm here with Dr. Lertzman. Um, she, Dr. Lertzman specializes in understanding the psychology of environmental issues, including climate change. Her book, Environmental Melancholia, focuses on the role of melancholia, loss, and mourning in how we effectively are able to respond and be proactive, imaginative, uh, and imaginative. She is currently working on a new book addressing um, the underlying psychology of inaction related to climate change and what we can do about it. She also works closely with organizations to apply this to their communication strategies and stakeholder engagement work. And so, Renee, I'd just love for you to briefly talk about some of the background with this work that you've been doing for so many years, mm -hmm. and then talk about how it can be applied to the current situation that we're in, um, this seventh day of sh sitting Shiva, and also as we move forward, um, and and about you know giving ourselves the space mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. to mourn and to feel the things we are feeling. Right. Great. Well, thank you. And thank you, Tara, so much for initiating and sparking this conversation. Um, I think as it will become clear in our time together, conversation is without question the most powerful and profound thing that we can be doing right now. It seems very mundane and very kind of uh, low tech, but it's incredibly powerful way for us as humans to make sense of and to process and relate with reality and what is happening. So I really want to um, express my appreciation for this happening and your, your kind of acting and serving as a convener. We need organizations like yours that serve as conveners right now uh, very much. And thank you to Alicia for getting in touch with me and kind of bringing me into this community with your organization, with the Institute. So um, I guess I would just start by saying that for a number of years, I've found myself uh, particularly drawn to understanding the mechanisms of loss and mourning and melancholia, and I'll explain in a minute what I mean by that, um, as it relates to our work in the environmental sector, including climate and social justice. Um, because, um, as Tara was saying earlier, it's, it's really hard to think about the work that we're doing in the world um, when we're working for change that, that doesn't involve to some um, extent or not some loss, right? But how we understand and relate with loss, my sense is that it's very um, kind of, we're just beginning to kind of get our our minds around this and begin to recognize that our our capacities to be kind of show up in the world and to have efficacy and to have impact is actually directly related to how we relate with our um, our own experiences around this and this has been a really tricky one especially for those working in Kind of the front lines of and i'm gonna i i focus on environmental change so I'm, that's my point of reference but you know working on the front lines um it's been really tricky because for obvious reasons you know we want to focus on having efficacy and and having um you know really focusing on being active and and having solutions and so forth and my observation over the years is that there's a perception that if we look at or even talk about loss uh, and mourning and grief, that we're somehow going to get completely stuck in that place, that we're going to literally just fall into a hole 
and and just kind of be in a in a well of despondency and all of our creative energies will get kind of i think that's the 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 the, the terror of that is is what comes up for people and um and what I found, you know, my the sources that inspired me the most are artists who work very kind of just in a very uh, um, matter of fact, kind of obvious way with the full range of human affect and emotion, um, as well as people who work with people, psychotherapists in particular, and psychoanalytic therapists who really, I think, bring and offer us a way of understanding um, the role of mourning and melancholia that I think is now is the time for us to really tap into and really like um, ground ourselves in. So, um, so just interrupt if you want, but I'll just keep talking oh, for a minute. No, okay. I love it. Okay. Keep going. So I want to just say, um, explain a little bit about why I focus on melancholia as it relates to environmental and climate action because they seem to be in complete uh, opposition to one another, right? Melancholia and action. Um, melancholia, as it was initially um, conceptualized and understood by Freud, and just to clarify, I'm not a Freudian, okay? But Freud um, was able to articulate and give rise to a number of insights that are still incredibly um, relevant and salient mm -hmm. for people working today. So that's just the fact. Um, so we're going to leave aside like whatever we think about Freud, but how he understands and, and talks about melancholia, if anyone were to pick up his essay, Morning and Melancholia, which is a classic essay, very short, it's really easy to, once you start reading it, to not, it, it's, it's hard not to immediately relate that to, oh my God, it sounds like he's describing exactly what we see going on around us, especially with regards to climate and environmental um, work. So the thing about melancholia that's really important is that it's about loss, right? It's, it's a response to, to loss. But the thing about it is that it's, it's sort of like um, when what's been lost isn't necessarily clear. So for example, um, it can be a loss of an ideal, mm -hmm. like we're experiencing to some degree, a loss of um, a sense of belonging. It can be a loss of identity. It can be a loss of dreams, of hopes, of aspirations, as well as actual loss. You know, people, you know, relationships, uh, a, 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 you know, a woodland, a river, a, you know, and, and, this came up when I was doing my field work in an industrial part of Wisconsin where the water and the ecosystems were very degraded. And I heard people kind of indirectly talking about this in a way where there was clearly a lot of loss, but they weren't able to articulate exactly what had been lost. And the result was that people were unable to see themselves as having agency. People were unable to see that the very rivers and the water that they were feeling um, grief around having lost to contamination, uh, toxic, you know, impacts and so forth, that there was a potential for repair, for um, creatively engaging with that. The reason why is because that's how melancholia tends to work, is that there's sort of this, like, looking back and like a nostalgic longing, but it hasn't been processed. So this brings us to, yeah, because it has May I, uh, May I, uh, 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 something yeah. clearly. Something to clearly to to <laughs> I was just gonna say, is that because it hasn't been named? It hasn't been Exactly. And that's where our what we're at, um that is part of the kind of uh, landscape when it comes to understanding and thinking about how humans negotiate loss, right? There's actual loss, there's imagined loss, there's the what you're referring to as forecasting and anticipatory loss, that these things affect us um, profoundly just as much as actual loss that has happened in the past. Um, so, so yeah, so I think, I think what's being called on us right now is one, to be able to get clear with ourselves and with one another about what it is that, um, 
that we're experiencing. And, and I just, I feel like it's really important to mention that it may not be very clear right now. Mm -hmm. Right. And so there's a tendency to want to sort of push, push ourselves and push one another towards um, coherence, towards, um, towards sense making. And with loss, and I'm going to actually also bring in trauma in here, because I experience what's going on as traumatic. Um, I feel that we're going through basically a collective form of trauma. And the thing about trauma and loss is that there's a certain uh, aspect of it that defies our capacity to really get our minds around and make sense of. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? That um, at least what I notice is that the mind kind of is like constantly um, working and working to make sense of and to come up with um, kind of uh, ways of, of framing and, and, and engaging with what's real. I mean, that, that's, that's, of course, what we do as humans. We're in a place right now where there's a lot that's unknown. There's an incredible sense of uncertainty. And this is why I think it's really important for those working in climate change and environmental work to really, really do ourselves a favor and understand at deeper levels what happens for people when we're dealing with a lot of uncertainty, which is anxiety. You know, that there's incredible anxiety going on. And that the tendency when that comes up is that we go into what we already know. Um, well, you know, we, we understand a lot about defense mechanisms. And so defending um, anxiety, loss, and all, you know, all these things tends to look like denial. It looks like projection or blaming. There's a lot of rationalization. So that article that was circulating about Obama being in denial was actually very smartly written because the, the person writing it really did talk about, um, you know, these kind of um, characteristics of what happens when we are in um, in anxiety and in um, kind of a you know in that heightened place of of loss and trauma. Um, I I guess I also want to just mention because I'm anticipating that it might come up is the model of the stages of grief by Kubler Ross. Um, I do not. I, I, I guess I would say I, I don't I don't know how helpful that is. And and the reason why, I mean it's it's a much bigger conversation. But the reason why there is includes the fact that that kind of stages of grief model, there's some elements that I think we can all identify with and relate with, but it's also one was generated um, in relation to actual death like in the death of people in our lives. And um, it's also been kind of critiqued and, you know, subsequently that it's, you know, in reality, these things are much more dynamic and interrelated than just these cycles. Can you just, not can you tell us um, just what those cycles are? So we have, a, some people might not be familiar with it, just a reference. If I can remember, um, do you remember what they are? There's there's um, denial, denial, um, anger, anger, bargaining, and then acceptance, and then depression. Um, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, it's not it's not hard to to look up, but um, but yeah. So the thing that I would caution us around is that we're not. We have to be really careful about applying um, concepts and models to um, contexts that are not necessarily what we're dealing with now, which is, you know, the fact is, is that there's a lot that is unknown, that there's a lot, that means that there's a lot that's, that, uh, where there's a lot of potential, right? And uh, I, yeah, I just think it's really, you know, part of me just feels cautionary about our tendency to want to hold on to these models and try to use them to make sense of what's happening. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll just add one one final thought before we open it up into more of a discussion is to um, 
connect um, the the process and experience of of loss, anticipatory loss, and melancholia with action and with being effective, as you say. And um, I guess the main thing I would just want to say about that again, a lot more could be said, but our you know one way of thinking about this is um, if we think about resilience, which is a concept that's really been um, very popular of recent years, right? When we think about resilience. Um, one of the things I think it's important for us to remember is that our resilience as human beings includes our capacities to abide with and, and kind of almost like make friends with the whole, you know, all parts of ourselves and all aspects of our experience, including feeling a lot of despair and including feeling hopelessness, including feeling fatalist, including feeling angry and frustrated, that one thing that we know from many years of psychotherapy and psychodynamic work and research is that when, when we as humans have the ability to really kind of be with what is, to really show up with ourselves mm -hmm. and be with what is and not evaluate it and judge it and reject it and criticize it, but to just be like, this is what's happening right now, we are so much more capable and resilient than we would be if we're constantly trying to sort of push things away. Um, and the other thing that's really important about that is that in our showing up with our experience, we give others and one another permission. So it's one of those weird, like it's, mm -hmm. it's one of these mysterious things where it's almost like I can sense in you without you even saying anything, how open you are to what I might be experiencing, whether that's sadness, grief, depression, mm -hmm. frustration, I just kind of sense it. And if I'm in the presence of people where it's really accepted and it's okay, it gives me permission to access that in myself. And, um, and what, what happens is that when there's that ability to kind of be with and name and articulate and talk about, we tend to move through it so much more quickly. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we generally, don't get, you know, this is the paradox of change. The paradox of change is that we're much more likely and able to change when we feel that wherever we are and what we're experiencing is accepted and is okay, we will then move quickly out of it mm -hmm. and into another place. Mm -hmm. If we feel that what we're feeling is not okay, it's a bummer, it's negative, it's like giving up, it's passive, whatever, we're much more likely to mm -hmm. stay stuck mm -hmm. in that place. And that's, it is a complete paradox. And for a lot of activists and people who are really action oriented, it, it may not make a lot of sense, but it's actually true. And so, you know, I would invite us to experiment with this mm -hmm. in our interactions. I mean, I had to give a talk in Amsterdam the day after the election, and it was a terrifying prospect because I was a wreck. You know, I was a mess. And I had to get up in front of people and and somehow show up for that. And um, and what I ended up doing was simply inviting people to share how they were feeling right off the bat. And it just immediately changed the the mm -hmm. the, the field in the room. We didn't dwell and you know we didn't get into deep discussions. It was just like you don't need a whole lot to just be like okay, and then we move forward. So, I, I'd like to, I'd, I'd Mary, like to, Mary, Mary, um, I'd, I'd um, like to touch on that for a minute because I think that's uh, really important, um, particularly in the work we do. I mean, we are working on climate change, and you know, just like both of you, um, and on environmental issues, and how do we actually inspire people? So, you know, I'm really curious with that. Um, your concept of acceptance, because as you had mentioned, I think a lot of times, and when faced with loss we see acceptance on almost as like, like you had said, giving up, giving in, you know, and that's a big thing when we talk about communicating climate change effectively is a lot of people feel totally overwhelmed, you know, and, and once they accept it's happening, it's suddenly like, oh my God, I can't, I can't handle it. So I would love to hear a little bit more about your ideas of, of like n navigating that acceptance, um, if, if you would. You would. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so, 
So without question, what we're needing and wanting is to tap into uh, inspiration and aspiration. And I think what I'm trying to um, articulate is the relationship between inspiration, aspiration, and um, and reality of loss, and um, yeah, of 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 what is, um, and to encourage ourselves and one another to not really see those things as. Um, in opposition or as binaries. It's it's a tricky one to talk about because it's kind of um it's almost like a like a Buddhist koan or something. Um but um well, we have to. I mean we have I, to. I think that that's I think I think what we're actually seeing like when you were saying like how difficult we are when things aren't clear and how we have to get clear and, and part of that is naming and so everything that I think we've collectively been dealing with, with the environment and all the loss that's been unprocessed, Trump was able to get very clear on those things, mm -hmm. or, or not on those things, but on just his message was very clear to, you know, a population that had feelings of profound loss. And um, he usurped those feelings in, 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 in his, his messaging. And so I think we can see where, I mean, where those kind of unresolved issues can, can manifest with us, you know, and we yeah. have to now um, in our communities, you know, kind of do the work of mm -hmm. processing and mm -hmm. acknowledging mm -hmm. what this is and what we are losing and what we may lose. Right, right. In order to effectively mm -hmm. communicate. Right. I think that there's an incredible um, worry and almost phobia of those working on climate and environment to to go there in terms of really openly acknowledging um, loss and devastation mm -hmm. and um, and so forth. And I think that's been the environmental community's downfall, to be honest. I you know what what without being apocalyptic yeah exactly without being like what we're fear. right i mean what we're needing right now is an integrated like we need to be integrated as human beings which is to say that it's not black or white it's not about hope and despair it's not about positive negative you know what what psychological health is about is being able to tolerate uncertainty being able to tolerate ambiguity and paradox and all those things that you know honestly artists and designers and you know creative people deal with all the time um, we have to be able to 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 develop capacities in ourselves and in one another to tolerate this and likewise what we're needing is a a, a movement and a community kind of within you know communities within the movement that give permission to and encourage integration and what that looks like is not saying oh that's you know let's not focus on that let's only focus on inspiration and hope and we don't want to bump people out we don't want to be too doom or gloom that's a very precarious very psychologically socially very very uh fragile um place to be coming from you know strength what, what i would love to see is like now is the time for us to really step into being fierce and strong, but like really, you know, grounded in the full spectrum. And what that looks like is messaging and campaign design and engagement that acknowledges right out front, like this is really scary or this is really hard. We know that, we know that you're feeling X, Y, and Z. And that's why we're all doing this together. And that's why we need to be working together. And that's where you come in. That's where you have an incredible role to play. And that's, you know, it, so it becomes really about an invitation to come into a story that we're all collectively developing and generating ourselves. But it's not about saying, oh, we have to be, we have to inspire people. The, the truth is that humans respond to truth. Humans respond to, we have a radar, 
to authenticity. And unfortunately, we also saw what happened with how that got really just perversely co-opted with the Trump campaign where Make America Great Again, I mean, that's a very visceral, um, there's something, there's an emotional truth in what he was tapping into that has everything to do with loss and melancholia, right? He just, he was able to name it and he was able to like tap right into that. He gave it the wrong name, I think. <laughs> yeah. But right. he named it. <laughs> he named it. And then he, he directed all that energy right into kind of the wrong, the wrong object to use a psychoanalytic term, you know? Um, well, I'd, so, I'd love, I'd, I'd love to, 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 to follow up a little bit up with a little bit. idea of the inspiration, because it's actually in our mission to actually inspire people to take action. Um, but I'd like to maybe push back and explore together um, this idea that, um, what I would say a falsehood that inspiration necessarily comes, you know, has to be like happy go lucky. I mean, there's inspiration can come out of great chaos, out of pain, out of, you know, out of humor, out of, you know, it really can come out of the range. And so maybe, um, you know, I wonder your thoughts on maybe not saying, Oh, it's, it's, you know, we're not just about inspiration, but understanding, that idea that we can create inspiration in so many different ways, including exploring loss and sadness. Um, any thoughts on any that? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. I mean, I think your organization is a little unusual in that. Um, you know, I think I'm speaking more generally to a lot of climate and environmental groups where um, there is a sort of a manic tendency to want to be positive. Does that make sense? Um, I think, you know, in terms of how we would, ways of framing this, um, engage how people can, you know, supporting people to engage, you know, I might think of it a little bit differently than, um, you know, I think inspiration is in there. I would also think about um, what are the, you know, what are the conditions, you know, what are the, what are the optimal conditions that really facilitate and support our capacities as human beings to access our fullest creative selves. So it's a little bit different. I mean, it's kind of like inspiration, but for me, that's the question that is a very alive, open question that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm exploring as much as I can. And, and in these, in, in these conversations with you all who are doing actively exploring this in your work, um, how do we, you know, what are the conditions that really facilitate and foster creativity, imagination, tenacity, um, grit, you know, empathy, compassion, all those things that we know are really integral to being effective in the world and, and, um, and making change happen. So, um, yeah, I guess I, I agree with you that I, I think that when I think about how inspiration is related to in our culture, I do think the tendency is for it to be seen as a little bit more like um, in that, in a more lighter, like, oh, I feel inspired to, you know, clean my house or I feel inspired to go to that march or whatever. Mm -hmm. But but when I heard you talking, it really connected me immediately to the precedents around the world where enormous creativity and inspiration comes out of incredible circumstances, like mm -hmm. really dire, really a lot of pain. Right. And one of the things that you specifically, you know, for calling out specifics, you had said, you know, having these conversations right now, like is, is maybe the work at this moment. Mm -hmm. um, and this moment might be this week or it might be this year. Um, but but holding that and, you know, I, for one, most of my social engagements over the last week have been invitations to things for people trying to get people together, um, not socially, but in order to um, brainstorm projects, whether they be art projects mm. that are um, small acts of resistance or um, ways to get community together to respond, um, mm -hmm. you know, 
having call days, having teach-ins, you know, all of these things. I mean, that's, Mm -hmm. and I feel like that's been a really healthy response. Yeah. I think it is a really healthy response. And I would say that for some people being active and doing is, um, is the medicine is the healing. And for others, it's just being with your feelings and like being quiet Mm -hmm. and, um, doing whatever makes sense for you. And my concern is that people might feel, I, I, I feel like I have to somehow, um, just, you know, bring into the picture that, um, I think we have to be careful about a tendency to want to push and um, in, in psychoanalysis, the term is manic. So there's like the, the term is manic defense. So when we're manically defending, you know, we're, there's a flight from something. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just into action when you have it actually. Yeah. I think it's, it's a very nuanced distinction between when you're manically in in a manic flight from feeling and being and when you're actually taking action from a place of um that more integrated kind of whole you know mm-hmm. what i'm saying mm-hmm. and it's it's very it's very tricky so i'm not down on action i'm just saying i think it helps us to just um be mindful of what's going on mm-hmm. um and it's Mer- not cut Mer- dry either right Definitely. Sorry. Definitely. Sorry. Keep interrupting I keep interrupting you. you. No, no. Um, I wanted to touch, um, on, I wanted that to touch on that personally that, personally that uh, brings up a lot of things for me in terms of I am, for anyone who knows me, I mean, I am an incredibly action oriented person. You know, that's where I'm in my zone. You know, I don't care what the challenge is. You can make the challenge, you know, impossible. But like, if I, if I have, like we had said before, I have that end goal, that vision, then, you know, I love creating the path there. Um, but I have, have noticed in the past week, and I, I'm really interested in your perspective on this, um, for me personally, I've really recognized that I am not ready for action because I don't know what that end goal is. I know it's still my end goal is, of course, the commitment to our climate work, to our organization, to you know, getting more knowledge, to building more community around this. But I'm wondering, um, you know, but it was really interesting because I, I, it doesn't feel like myself. And I'm really curious, you know, I'm, I'm giving that anecdote because you, know, you had just mentioned people processing in very different ways, particularly around loss. And I'm wondering, do you have ideas of how we therefore support each other in that we are reacting in different ways and might need, you know, different things because we're each different human beings, you know, in order to continue our work, to make our work better. How do we support in this, in this way? Way. Right. Well, um, yeah, I mean, you bring up something incredibly important, which is, um, and it's just, you know, happens to be the work that you're involved with invoking the pause, right? So I actually love that phrase and I've been um, invoking that phrase <laughs> um, because I think it's it's so profoundly important that it's about right action. It's about skillful action or uh, skillful means, right? With the Buddhist term which is that acting from that place of clarity in terms of what, um, what action feels like mm-hmm. and looks like for you. So I really appreciate your mentioning that and saying that. And I'm hearing that from a lot of people as well who are very active, activist oriented. Um, in terms of how we can support each other, I mean, my initial response is to ask you and to ask you, Alicia, how, what your thoughts are about that. So I'll just mention you know, what comes to mind for me and then just see what, what your reflections are on that. Cause I'm, I'm thinking you have thoughts too and have been processing this as well. So, um, so it might not be surprising, you know, that my, my take on that is simply the best way we can support one another is to really allow one another to be where we are and to um, really be incredibly gentle in terms of how we um, suggest and make recommendations around action. Um, 
the the thing about that though is it requires it's an inside job in order to do that because if we're feeling ourselves um you know if we're in conflict with our own experience we're going to bring that into every relationship we have so if you for example you're sharing some sadness with me and you're really you know i'm just feeling really bummed out i'm feeling really sad if i'm like not okay with that in me I'm going to very likely be very uncomfortable with that and I'm going to try to like manage you in some way. So I might say, you know, you might feel better if you get out for a walk. Why don't we go do something? You know, I'm going to try to problem solve and and make things a little bit different rather than just saying, look, you know, I'm here for me whenever you need. I trust you that I know that you know what you need. That's really powerful to express that voice of trust in your, mm -hmm. your own kind of, um, you know, your own internal compass, your own knowing. Because when I hear that you trust me, it gives, it, again, it gives me more permission to trust myself. Um, so, so what I'm saying is, you know, allowing people to be where they are is fundamental and in order to do that is also about allowing ourselves to kind of be where we are right so it's, it's just one of those things um and um and i do feel again as we started out this conversation um i i really feel like just the ability to talk about what's going on um and just say, this is how, this is what's coming up for me right now. And to not change it. You know, I think that's really incredibly healing, incredibly healing. I've learned a lot from something, um, a practice called motivational interviewing that I use in my consulting work. It's, um, it's a, an approach that was developed in the public health sector in terms of how to talk with people. Sorry. I'm like facing you're this you're great but um it's it's a it's it's kind of like um an orientation and a spirit of how to talk with people about really hard change changes like with addiction and um you know sugar addiction or health issues and i'm using it a lot in my climate and environment and energy work right now because it's really beautiful in that the spirit of it is about respect and partnership and collaboration as opposed to i'm trying to get you or make you motivated or engaged or like you know to do something basically that i want and need you to do which is like to take action on climate change mm -hmm. right so again this is the 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 paradox is that when we're coming from that place of you know that's okay if you're not ready right now and when you are ready I know that you will be awesome. You know, that's something I've learned that's really mm -hmm. powerful is that voice of that vote of confidence. You know, I know that when you're ready, you'll be right. You, you will be so awesome. Like you will shine. You know, I would like people to say that to me, to be honest, you know, it's like, it would just feel great. It's like, Hey Renee, I know mm -hmm. you're feeling like kind of discombobulated right now. And like your nervous system is a little afraid, but, I know that in time you're going to you're going to come through this and you're going to feel really like more yourself again. And when, you know, just when you're ready to talk, you know, get in touch. As opposed to that friend or community that's like, "Come on, like we got to, you know." So there's that, and then there's this relationship with action and being creative and staying engaged and showing up. And um and that's beautiful and healing and important and necessary right now too. So I wouldn't want anyone to think that I'm suggesting that we are not active, mm -hmm. that, you know, we don't see that as our uh, medicine, but again, going back to um, having some kind of respect for how we find our way there. I think these are, this is a really, um, this is a, this is a, from, this is a very disorienting time, you know, um, the writer Annie Dillard wrote this great essay called Total Eclipse. And I find myself thinking about that essay, Total Eclipse, because it's this beautiful articulation of what happens when just the world 
just becomes just changes. And for her, it was when the sun disappeared um, for those few moments. But, you know, in her typical fashion, she elaborates on that as an existential kind of uh, moment. And she really is able to articulate how, like, on a certain level, we can't really process what's going on. And that gets back to death and loss. Um, and um, and I, I, my experience is that this is a, this is a rather disorienting time. I feel like the, you know, the, the rug was pulled out from under me. But what's really interesting is that I know that millions of people feel that way too. Mm -hmm. Millions of people mm -hmm. feel exactly that way. So um, I feel like I'm now I'm kind of rambling a little bit, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not, you're, you're not, not, you're not. But I would also I add, would also add other, other people, that are, people that are, are again, concerned or on of social justice or climate change. It's like we're always kind of dealing with consistent loss. And so even, you know, this is like adding, adding to that. And, but I think just these types of conversations, like you had said, are ones that we don't have um, within our communities, or at least I, I haven't seen it. And I think uh, something that I kind of, is a little bit of a mantra to me is that we can't be sustainable out there and build a sustainable world without having actually sustainable lives. And that doesn't mean just, you know, that we compost. It means that our psyche is, is in a state where we don't get burned out, where we, where we can be our awesome selves so it's you know I'm I'm very appreciative of of uh, this conversation. I just wanted to throw that in there. You're awesome. How was that? <laughs> <laughs> so are you? You are. <laughs> no, it's so interesting. All of that was so interesting for me. Um, you know, I I've, I've had. You know, I immediately like the Wednesday after the election, I had certain friends texting me with like fully formed art projects, hmm. documentaries they were going to do like, full, like, like, Oh, I'm going to, and, and then I'm going to do the like, wow. Big projects that were, um, you know, multi-year endeavors. Mm. And it was so interesting because it was like, that was, um, their response. That was their like way was immediately to go into mm -hmm. like generating. And that was their healing. And then I, um, you know, I feel a little bit different in, um, I, although I, of course I know the work that I do and that we do is enormously important. I don't, when these kind of crises happen, I don't always respond to them with that. Well, it, this just makes the work that we do ever more important and valuable and da, da, da. And I'll sometimes say that to people sort of as a, sales pitch or a defense mechanism or something, but I, I actually have profound moments where I question like the work that I'm doing and where it's situated and what it has been doing. And, um, and I do have moments of, of, uh, hopelessness is the wrong word, but, mm -hmm. but something, some amount of, of that and 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 yet i do feel like that's where new work comes out of or or, or you know i i know that that's part of the stage mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. continuing with that but it's a it's a very uncomfortable place to be because you know one wants to yeah. respond to this and say oh well that's why the work i do in the world or the work mm -hmm. that we do in the world is ever more important um right well it's like this profound thing has just happened exactly um I guess I would say that it's so vital that we as a community and ourselves like welcome that in with open arms. Like I, I would love to see people working in this space, including myself, um, somehow develop this capacity to not be so afraid of those times when we feel like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know if what I'm doing is helpful. Um, I might need to rethink everything that I'm doing. Um, that's healthy. That's like, that's a, that's a really natural kind of process. And when we short circuit ourselves from having those times, they may last weeks and months and years. They may last seconds, 
moments. But that's what am I? I mean, I think we all know that that's that's what really enables us to to show up and and figure out what makes most sense and how to be most effective. But it's really scary. I mean, it's really really scary to have those times. Um, and and that's where having psychotherapy is really powerful is because you know one of the main reasons therapy works that has been already well it's been well established now is it's about the relationship between you and the other person and there's a container where you you have that kind of um it's it's safer to go into those places mm -hmm. so i'm not necessarily saying that we all need to go into therapy i'm suggesting that we become much more creative and innovative and entrepreneurial within the climate and environmental movement on how do we simulate what that looks like in our in our um, activism and in our social change work? How do we simulate that? And it's not necessarily rocket science. You know, it could be forming circles, forming groups, having process when you open a meeting, like having creating a discourse and a language where it's actually okay to talk about this stuff. And I have to say that I really see this happening more and more. And I think that this has been already in development. I mean, people are more interested in the kind of work I'm doing, which is um, an indication of that. That didn't used to be the case. So within the past few years, there, there's been a curiosity about, I think there's something here that's important. And, and, um, and how do we figure out how to translate what we're talking about into mm -hmm. actual mechanisms and tools and that's that's what i'm most excited about mm -hmm. is how do we translate this into um specific resources strategies um tools um you know and and i believe 100 percent that we can do it but it is it is a bit of an innovation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and i would also encourage us to collaborate and partner a lot more with artists and with therapists with psychologists and um in both cases there's there's vast communities of artists and therapists who want to engage and they don't know how they they're like you know i want to get involved but it's like you know especially for people who've just been doing kind of focusing on their own work for a number of years and now they're like okay i feel like it's time for my work to have more impact and more relevance i don't know I don't know where to go with this. I don't know where to start. It's it's, it's a profound time for that. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, that the amazing yeah. thing about this is that like, we all just got like a blank slate. We all mm -hmm. just got like a hit the refresh page on things. So mm -hmm. for people who are feeling that, I think yeah. it's a rare opportunity where you can acknowledge mm -hmm. that other people are also mm -hmm. feeling that and you can engage with them and say, I need that shifter. Right. Right. And I would like to see more organizations from big NGOs to little NGOs and government agencies as well put out an open call and invitation say, hey, we're going to have an open house and we'd really like to hear from you if you're an artist or a therapist. <laughs> like, come on in mm -hmm. and ha like have a reception, have a, a little party or something, have a, a way for people to interact and get to know each other and explore like what makes sense here i mean maybe i need to just do that mm -hmm. like <laughs> host or convene something because i really see this is the time there's you know and the way that i think about it is there's a lot of potential that we need to be tapping yeah. right yeah. from yeah. these disciplines well that's def well, definitely that's something definitely that we're something looking we're doing to do and i'm hoping that i'm hoping that online, online conversation conversation so to uh, other forms of you know face to face is always a lot nicer and a glass of wine can help sometimes too i think <laughs> Um, um, we only have a we few only have a few left. Few if we want to stick with an hour, we're going to um, have any, we're gonna um, have any audience, um, questions audience questions now. Questions. But are there other things that you guys wanted to make sure we covered? I, I thought one of the questions that was quite interesting um, that was earlier from one of your colleagues, Tara, was um, um, how do you process? Uh, deal with and process when we're constantly being bombarded with information and perspectives and 
Mm. Like that, I mean, I think, I think this is also a fascinating time. And, you know, part of how we got into this pickle is that we're, mm -hmm. you know, so, so much, but right. I think, I think a lot of people have been, yeah, in mm -hmm. reading everything they can right. because of that. And other people are shutting off and right. Thoughts. I feel like that's such a, that's such a personal question that I wouldn't want to prescribe, be prescriptive about it. Mm. Um, because the obvious, an obvious response is how do you deal a process when we're constantly being bombarded with information is simply titrate the information. But, you know, I feel really wary about saying that because that's not necessarily appropriate for mm. everyone. And, and I'm, and I'm not suggesting we shouldn't be tuned into what's happening. Um, I think it relates to what we've been talking about, which is cultivating an attitude of kindness and compassion for ourselves and, and maybe increasing our vig vigilance on being able to kind of check in with how we're doing and where we are. Um, some people are more tuned into that than others. Um, again, a lot of people who work in change are, are tend to be very externally focused and maybe not as introspective and that's not a criticism it's just like kind of a almost temperamental kind of thing but that's the response I have is um, is being able to kind of uh, you know connect with yourself maybe in a in a in a deeper way than than we have previously but I don't really have a quick kind of response to that um i i have another i, I have another thing that's difficult thing that's difficult me, um, and maybe you as well i think that even though i'm so wholeheartedly believe in like invoking the pause in that we do have to give ourselves time to mourn and to 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 uh process um and everything that we've been talking about i also find myself internally fighting and saying we can't pause, you know, we can't, you know, there, there is such urgency on the issues, you know, if we're dealing with climate change, no, we've been pausing too long, we can't. So I, I just feel this internal struggle, um, you know, and I'm, I'm always interested in the gray areas anyways, but I wonder if either of you have uh, opinions or additions to that Addition idea. To that idea. Um, well, I guess I would, I would say, It it, go, it it kind of goes back to a, a, the attitude that we have towards um, the pause, right? And it's kind of how we approach it or how we think about it in terms of um, what it's really about. In terms of is it is it about stepping away? Is it about reflection? Is it about getting clear? Is it about um, being with, feeling, um, I mean, that is the inherent tension that we're in right now. That is the tension. And, um, you know, my initial response when I hear you talking about it is, you know, and this is just me, this is where I'm coming from. I would say, oh my God, like we totally need to encourage ourselves and one another to take a pause. Like it's, it's so, needed but you know it's it's um i think it's about trusting that our energies and our efforts will very likely be so much more uh fruitful and productive and constructive when we when we have that kind of rhythm. And I guess the other thing that comes up is around, I think there's a tendency to be very absolute about these things. Like there's action and there's pause. What about, and I'm not saying you were being like that, but I think we generally have a tendency to think that way. What about thinking a little bit more in a more nuanced way about it, which is how do we in integrate pause into our work as activists? What is it? I think about this as being spacious and active. 
So how can we be spacious and active at the same time? Mm -hmm. That's a really, I think, you know, a good question to ask. What does that look like for you? To have spaciousness and to have a pause while staying engaged and staying connected. That it's not necessarily this kind of like, okay, I'm totally unplugging and I'm like going off in a, in a, cabin whatever or backpacking or I'm I'm on the front lines and I'm like right in it what if we think about being active and engaged and right in it but also cultivating some capacity for for that reflection for the pause for you know it could be a meditation practice it could be 10 minutes a day it could be throughout the day taking a few minutes it could be certain practices and um, methods that we bring in so that we are giving ourselves that really necessary and needed um, respite. Because it is, it's a lot, it's a lot to deal with. Um, and I think that we all kind of find our way there. Um, the other thing I would just say is that it goes back to the kind of individual and the social relationship that we tend to talk about individuals a lot. But what I want to come back to again is that how we relate with one another is how we, um, how we create new ways of social interaction around these things that supports the individual and the whole. Does that make sense? So it's not just like, okay, here I'm going to take my pause or I'm going to do my reflection. It's like, how do we, how do we bring this in and including, you know, like I've said, I would love to see as you know, this area, this um, sector just become much more, emotionally literate and less phobic about talking about hardship mm -hmm. right did you want to say anything yeah i mean i guess like in the 60s we were like out of time you know and then and then like that happened and um reagan happened and um and then in the 90s and the Kyoto Protocol, it's like, like we've constantly had this, we don't have time. And I think we all absolutely tremendously have felt that in these past years, especially as it's becoming visceral, the warming of our planet. Um, so I think we all really feel like we, we don't have time and yet, we didn't have time eight or nine days ago before this election when we assumed that the Paris Agreement would stay on on target. And when we, we kind of assumed that things would, like business as usual wasn't okay then. And now we potentially have this huge major setback. And I think we, we did get ourselves into that place maybe because you know, we haven't been engaging with everyone in mm -hmm. a way that, you know, people can access. So it's yeah. like, I don't know, that that's just some thoughts on the, the type, because I agree with that. The sense of urgency is so mm -hmm. profound and real for me. And yet, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I think showing up in our humanness, that's what I really got from my interviews in Wisconsin. It's like the more that we can show up in our humanness um, gives permission for others to be human as well. And that includes talking about, I feel really scared. Or, I feel really worried or I feel really excited. I feel really inspired, you know, that as much as we can mm -hmm. be that um, open, um, it's breaking the taboo of talking about it. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I, actually I would. I actually it. had a, an experience. I was thinking, I was thinking earlier when, when you were talking, talking about, about, um, about, you know, sharing. What I would say, sharing vulnerabilities is, I think, particularly, and and this might be true for the three of us in that, you know, we are actively working on climate change, um, you know, and environment, and our we do ha talk a lot. You know, we have communities. I, I, I know, um, I think we're all educators and in different ways as well. Um, that I've found, uh, I've gotten really profound, 
responses when I've started with my own personal vulnerabilities, when I talk with people, when I say like, some days I just wanna pretend climate change doesn't exist. Like I do, I have those days too, you know, and that people, you know, when I'm, and I'm ashamed of that, I'm ashamed of having those feelings, but when I communicate that, particularly as someone I think who heads an organization and is doing this work, um, I've really experienced people telling me that it opens up the door for them to, like you had said, Renee, um, to be able to express their own, um, you know, dirty secrets <laughs> around climate, and then to and then to move forward, like you had said. So, um, I wanted to share that that personally, um, uh, I've found great impact in that. And I wonder if you're open to maybe closing. Um, I would be really excited about personally sharing our hows, like how we're personally navigating this right now. I think we've done some of that, but would you be open to that? Open to that? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Um, Great. Do you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Sure. <laughs> Um, I, so I'm gonna, I have to put you on mute when I talk so that the thing doesn't go back and forth. And I also have to put the sound on mute. I, I'm doing a lot of clicking on this side. Anyways, so for me, how I've been navigating um, the past week, but also how I navigate um, you know, my lifelong commitment to environmental, um, uh, the environmental movement and to uh, inspiring people. Um, is that I I do yoga. I, I feel like yoga really keeps me sane. Um, I've always been a very uh, physical person as well. I've always been an athlete. So just doing the things that I know center me and, and bring out goodness and that are healthy for me and my body, I'm really, I emphasize that even more in these times. So I'm doing, when I can, more yoga, um, you know, dancing, being surrounded by, um, you know, and inviting the people that, that do inspire me in many different ways and are great support systems, being around them, um, <clears throat> being open to listening has been big for me. And something that's been huge is also allowing myself to not have to do action right now um, has been big and I think is really helping me find some of that clarity that I'm, I'm seeking that you were talking about before, Renee. Um, and a, another thing that's because, again, I am a doer, so it's not complete inaction. As you had said, I am navigating the two in terms of a pause while doing, um, is doing things like this with, with trying to find ways to share the privilege and the access to resources that I do have um, with others. So talking with my yoga studio about doing free classes for the community, um, having a conversation with you guys, things like that. And for me, you know, I'm so lucky to have access to so many of these things. You know, if there are ways that I can, you know, help share that, that that's also helping me process. There you go. <laughs> that's me. That's me. <laughs> I, I don't know that my mine isn't as healthy. Um, I definitely, um, I, and I was telling Renee this a, a, a bit ago, I had a number of, for a number of different projects, I had a number of deadlines that were very back to back um, for pretty much August, September, October, and November. And then I um, was finishing a class I was teaching at CCA at uh, one o'clock on election day. And then was gonna go study my ballot, which I hadn't had a single chance to. And we had like 57 props on the thing. And so I was gonna do that and then go cast my vote. And then I was just gonna like have a beer and start thinking about the holidays and start thinking about processing some of the backlogged work that I had done. And I was like, just so looking forward to that release of having all of that over and, um, and having the election over. And even though I, I, I think a lot of people in my community, I think a lot of people were really like 
profoundly shocked that things went the way they were. And I actually, I wasn't as much, but I still hmm. didn't think they'd go the way they did. And so it's oddly that like release has, you know, not happened at all. It's, it's been this like, okay, now it's time to bunker down more and to save more and to um, give more and to, you know, do more. And, and, and so that's been really interesting, but I, um, I've also found, I have in the past couple of years been very unactive in spaces in like, um, Facebook. And yet I felt, um, after the election results came in, I felt like a deep regret for that. Um, that I wasn't more vocal in that space prior to the election. And I recognized how much fear I was carrying around in just having so many different communities that I maybe compartmentalize, um, you know, because I have people from my past who are conservative as well as um, people who are very radical in my life. And um, and I think of myself as somewhat of a mediator in the way that I approach things. And so I've had this uh, response of, you know, really trying to um, be more public and communicate things more vulnerably and, and honestly. Um, and in a way that's been cathartic, but also um, also kind of, you know, it, it, I think I think that the whole I think we understand how siloed the echo chambers on those are, and yet like we can connect with a, a wide network. So it's it's been this like back and forth because I'm like, is that an appropriate response or is it an inappropriate response? And it's been um, just really interesting watching how much less fear I have since this. You know, before that I was like, oh well. I want to say that to this these this group, and I would want to say that to this group, and um, I've just been much more broad um, in what I'm, mm -hmm. you know, communicating. Mm -hmm. so. I, I forgot to I add that um, um, also, also eating a lot of macaroni and cheese and crying and avoiding news and uh <laughs> and watching tv so <laughs> yeah right on um i've been crying a lot too <laughs> yeah and i find that i cry when i talk like you know when i'm talking with someone right so i'm doing less crying kind of on my own at home but more like once i'm interacting with someone it, that's when it suddenly comes up um so I don't know, I mean, I guess a couple of things just quickly come to mind. One is that I'm really, my heart just feels really open right now. And I, I've been traveling a lot. So I was in Amsterdam and then I was in LA for the past two days. And I'm going to be, you know, traveling again in a few days. And my experience is I'm really like, really kind of seeing pe the humanity you know, seeing the people around me and I'm initiating interactions with people that I may not normally be doing. So I'm basically in a very gentle way, like, how's it going? What, you know, mm -hmm. how, how are you feeling right now on this, on the subway or whatever? So that's one thing I'm noticing that I think is a way of, for me to kind of manage what's happening is to just feel more connected. Um, I'm also currently abstaining from any kind of organizing activity. Like, you know, my neighborhood kind of had something happen last week and I was initially like, of course I have to go to that. And I realized that I wasn't ready to do that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, I mean, I also, you know, for transparency, have noticed my own kind of cycle of feeling a little manic and um, incredible sense of urgency, especially with the work I do. So my initial response was like, I have to be, you know, I have to get my work out there, like the world needs it. And, 
and mixed in with frustration and anger as well. Like, like, come on, you know, and, um, and that I'm, you know, I'm working with that and kind of like toning that down more. Um, and I had a revelation today. It's so basic, but I was like, literally, I think I was either on the plane or coming off the plane. I don't know. I had this thought that it's not down to me to save the world. Like it's, it, I think I've been really feeling like this enormous weight on my shoulders. And I realized that it's not down to me to do it, that it's really about, you know, um, recognizing that it's, it's truly like an all hands on deck moment. And that what I can do, you know, I can focus on what I can do and just focus on that. And what I'm focused on is making, you know, helping people who are trying to make change be more effective. So it sounds, you know, it, it was just felt very liberating to me to just kind of get that. Like, okay, if I just stay focused on what I'm, my work is about, which is a lot of what we've talked about, like really developing our resilience and our capacities and all that. It's not like I have to like fix everything. And um, that felt really important. So, you know. But I don't, I also am, kind of, you know, I am a nervous wreck too.